The late 70s and early 80s was quite a time to discover Bond films. While Roger Moore took his place at the cinema, Sean Connery was working his legacy on television. Then came the VHS. Faster than you can rewind the videotape came to arguments who was the better Bond. This video ranks the Moore era of Bond films from 1973, Live and Let Die, to A Few to a Kill of 1985. I will rank the films how I would recommend them, influenced by production quality and enjoyment as someone growing up in the 80s. Fair warning, my commentaries have a tendency to cause anxiety, rage, and disbelief. But that's why you're here, I hope. Kindly consider leaving a like, share, or subscribe if you enjoy this content. Let the comparisons begin. Wow. What a view to a kill. Number 7. A View to a Kill It's the age of silicon. It's also the era of the Cold War. When microchips impervious to electromagnetic pulse are discovered in the USSR, British secret intelligence gets a little skittish. Bond is sent to investigate the manufacturer, Max Zorin. Through the help of a mini land baron holding $5 million worth of real estate, Bond learns Zorin is running a real estate scheme that would make Lex Luthor proud. Zorn plans to blast the San Francisco Bay Area into the ocean, putting the chip manufacturers out of business, giving him an undisputed monopoly. Bond has to navigate his way through bathhouses, fire trucks, and zeppelins to save the future of high tech. Say what you want. This is the entry that ended Roger Moore's place in the Bond franchise. With only two years since Octopussy, it was evident in the opening act that Moore just didn't have the same energy or gusto. There should be a lot to like with Christopher Walken, Grace Jones, Patrick McNee, and a blink and you'll miss it moment with Dolph Lundgren. In retrospect, I would love to see how an older Bond uses Sleuth to infiltrate an otherwise aloof society with ulterior motives. But seeing slightly older people doing slightly older things isn't exactly a winning box office formula. Bond in the 80s demanded 80s action. While we got a decent opening ski scene ruined by a Beach Buddies song, at least my friend enjoyed it. He applauded so loud the entire cinema turned to look at him. Much of what we got, many times, was seeing someone hanging at the edge of something. Maybe this was the inspiration for Cliffhanger. Tanya Roberts may be the first Bond girl I heard of before I saw a James Bond movie. While I can't say she was a big name, she was a familiar one. Sheena may have something to do with it. This is partly what troubled the view to a kill. It could be her character was annoying, or maybe it's the age difference. Roger Moore was older than Tanya Roberts' mother, I hear. And now we're back to age and energy, which is disappointing since A View to a Kill has the best title song ever. By the end of the film, everybody caught on that having a man in his 50s exchanging double entendres with an 18-year-old is quite cringe, and a change had to be made. Moore knew it, Connery knew it, and the producers would have to do something quick before the fans moved on. What about... Zorin himself. Max Zorin, impossible. He's a leading French industrialist. You missed Mr. Bond. Did I? Number six, Moonraker. A fully fueled space shuttle is hijacked off the back of a jumbo jet in mid flight. This raises questions, of course. And James Bond is sent to investigate the shuttle's manufacturer, Drax Industries. Teaming up with the CIA, Bond learns Hugo Drax is not only a megalomaniac, but someone planning huge crimes against humanity. With the help of his henchman, Jaws, Drax is looking to wipe Earth's entire civilization clean through botanical developed agents and replace humanity with his own idea of a perfect society. 
What could go wrong? Moonraker took the place of, for your eyes only, scheduled to be released after The Spy Who Loved Me. However, the Star Wars craze happened, and the producers tried to cash in by giving the world the least Bond-like entry in the series' history, past and future. I know I'm going to raise eyebrows. There are things I like about Moonraker. Drax is a loathsome misanthrope, ripe for his comeuppance. Jaws returns as the oversized henchman, albeit with more comedy, a lot more comedy. I'm okay with it, others aren't so. But I can't get past the opening nor the final act, where the Space Force appears out of nowhere and we're somewhere between Kubrick's 2001 and a Simpsons episode that doesn't yet exist. I can't even get a pizza delivered this fast. Opinions on Moonraker depends on your idea of who James Bond is. Is he a debonair spy or an action-adventure hero? While the Connery-era films touched on broad themes that were contemporary for the time, the Moore era started to choose niche topics that were relevant for the day and dated quickly. Moonraker was a box office success. A very great success getting people into their seats. The legacy made after they stood up with less money in their pockets is another question. Was this a spoof riding the coattails of Star Wars or a serious contender for the next Goldfinger? If you're into James Bond in space, this might be for you. This isn't a terrible movie. Other than mistaking maneuvering engines for booster jets, carrying fuel while in transport, never mind the extra weight. <laughs> you some kind of doomsday machine boy number five live and let die three mi6 agents are murdered in 24 hours and all signs point to a small caribbean island of san monique and its dictator kananga bond hits the voodoo triangle of harlem new orleans and san monique and discovers a conspiracy of double identities Obia ceremonies and fortune telling. He also uncovers a plot to unload cheap drugs on the population to reset the market, making Kananga the king of the poppies. Live and Let Die was a rough start for the new era. It was Roger Moore's first gig as James Bond. He was still working to make the character his own, following Connery's legacy. Even rougher, making Live and Let Die a black exploitation movie. Something that was trending at the time. Right on, brother. But it dated quickly, and that's a muted description. It was dated in the 1980s when I first watched this on home VHS. Take away some few choice moments. One hammy scene from the King Ham of Hams. It's got obvious you weren't coming out front. Not even with that clever disguise you're wearing. Hmm? White face in Harlem. And it's a chilling story about a big man who answers to no one, winning the influence in parts of at least two American cities. Jane Seymour, as Solitaire, is easily the top two or three Bond women in the entire era of Bond. No sooner we get past the first half of the movie and its contemporary messaging comes J.W. Peppa, a god-awful twit. The less said of him, the better. Until he makes his second appearance in The Man with the Golden Gun. Live and Let Die begins as a fish out of water movie. Not a bad idea when introducing a new actor for Bond. For there are a lot of characters that seem odd or out of place. Maybe they really shouldn't be there. Or were never there to begin with. Quite appropriate for a movie with supernatural elements. Crisp and clean and no caffeine. Never had it, <laughs> never will. This is the part I really like. Now that's what I call solar power. Number four, a man with the golden gun. The energy crisis has pitted scientists against big oil. It's also the perfect time to strike against British secret intelligence. James Bond receives a not-so-subtle hint that he's marked for assassination by the legendary Scaramanga. 
There's also a MacGuffin, the Solex Agitator, a handheld device that will change the world, and it's not an iPhone. Bond has to discover Scaramanga's identity while traveling the exciting places of Hong Kong and Thailand before Scaramanga gets him into his sights. The Man with the Golden Gun is a guilty pleasure of mine, solely because of Christopher Lee. I like his character because by his own admission, doesn't know everything. Science was never my strong point. But he does know a lot about killing. The film was made when kung fu martial art movies were more popular. The soaring cost of energy was a thing, continuing the strategy of having Bond movies follow current day events. It does get criticism for being, well, sleazy. It does seem Bond just goes from skit to skit until the final one-on-one -on -one with Scaramanga. In retrospect, the movie does come across as a facade of something we remembered as more classical. Now we come to the return of J.W. Peppa. Is he funnier here? Is he less aggravating? He was deliberately written in as a deputy of all things. At least we get to see him dunked into a river before arrested and taken away, hopefully for a long, long time. This isn't going to rank high on many people's lists. There are some interesting themes about broken promises, the foreshadowing of come to life statues, but it also has Mary Goodnight. Well, you're not thinking that. I sure am, boy. <laughs> No head for heights. Number three for your eyes only. A super secret strategic submarine management device, the ATAC, is lost at sea. Well to do civilian contractors are hired to quietly recover the ATAC. However, a Cuban hitman assassinates the family. The surviving daughter vows revenge because it's the Greek way. Meanwhile, 007 is sent to retrieve the ATAC before it is sold to the Soviets that will win them the seas. Bond has to climb mountains to save the free world. Oh, there's a side plot involving a wannabe Olympic skater too. For Your Eyes Only was the franchise's return to its more grounded roots after the sci-fi fantasy attempt known as Moonraker. From the opening pre-title scene, one of the most enjoyable, it's obvious for your eyes only, is a revenge film. It's a more subtle film, I feel. No flamboyant villain, no memorable sidekicks, as this film has numerous henchmen that come and go. It shoehorns the Cold War with a race against the Soviets. It's a middling film that plays it safe, maybe too safe, but it does have a great title song. I wish I could say more about For Your Eyes Only, while editing this video to my scripted voiceover, I realize this film is nearly joyless. It's not very fun. It's not a bad film by any means. It's described aptly as boring but with good stunt work. Its retrospective reviews are far more forgiving, partly because it didn't take risks. This was not rough like Live and Let Die, nor tacky like The Man with the Golden Gun, but it didn't date itself either. It's just there, without an audacious, over-the-top space adventure, and I think a lot of fans secretly prefer. But it comes across as a production that held itself back, like they blew their budget with Moonraker and couldn't do too much here. That's what happens when you shoot for the moon. He'll do anything for me, and I'll do anything for you. Yes, well. Number 2. Octopussy James Bond investigates a conspiracy involving dead clowns, killer circus performers, counterfeit Fabergé eggs, and one rogue Soviet general's dream to invade its neighboring countries. Sounds like fiction, right? Throw in acrobatic thieves, a tennis player, and the Indian jungles, and you have Octopussy. 
Octopussy isn't without its problems. That being one of them. It's a divisive film. Invoking chirophobia in some viewers. It's also an ambitious film with two villains, a mean sidekick, and a femme fatale the movie is named after. It has humor, maybe a little too much. It has its share of henchmen, assassins, and good old reliable Cold War animosity. Released in 1983, Octopussy walks the line between straight up East vs. West World War III melodrama and a spy thriller about costume jewelry. It's one of the few examples where Bond doesn't rely on suave and polish to escape danger. He's actually frazzled here. He confronts representatives of the Soviet Empire directly. What starts out as a one large clown show quickly descends into nuclear madness. I'm going to guess I have Octopussy ranked higher than others would. But before closing with A View to a Kill, this was the last good Roger Moore Bond film. Even though they literally made a clown out of him. Where's Peckish? Pyramids! Ah! What a helpful chap. Number one, The Spy Who Loved Me. Both the British and Soviet navies mysteriously lose one of their submarines and crew. The British send their best, 007 to investigate. Meanwhile, the Soviets send their best, the enigmatic Agent Triple X. No, this is the 70s, where Triple X has more mature connotations. Bond and Triple X team up against a megalomaniac, land hating misanthrope, Carl Stromberg. Stromberg has a simple plan to wipe out humanity and live under the sea. What could go wrong? Before East and West destroy the world, it will take one from each side to save it. I wonder if Stromberg eats seafood. The Spy Who Loved Me is often going to be on the top of the list of many. It has a little bit of patriotic nationalism, a delusional villain, with overachieving engineering, including having his own hideout, worthy of a superhero movie. There's Jaws, who is as iconic as Oddjob, an Oscar-nominated title song, and enough double entendres that you could get away with only in the 70s. It even has a side plot about Bond having killed Triple X's lover. Will she take out her revenge? Spoilers, she doesn't. The Spy Who Loved Me isn't the perfect film. It retreads plot points from You Only Live Twice, has a prolonged conclusion of people chaotically shooting at each other, but it was a box office success, released in the same year as Star Wars. I didn't feel they needed to remake The Spy Who Loved Me as Moonraker, where we get another megalomaniac wanting to destroy the Earth with the help of stealing a ship and hiring Jaws. That's why The Spy Who Loved Me ranks number one, and Moonraker ranks somewhere else. Shaken, but not stirred. Let me know in the comments below. What was your favorite Roger Moore Bond film? This is Mr. G of Synergy saying, There's always time for Foo Yuck. Check out other videos on my channel. Thanks for watching.